The McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. Now, here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. David, you're just getting back from New Orleans. This is a conference of all the conferences of the year that you probably feel the most at home at because it goes back decades with your family. Well, it's interesting, Kevin. I mean, we do travel a lot, and there's a variety of different conferences that we'll speak at and present at, and this one is a little bit like old home week. You, right. know, you have the conference has been around since 1974. Jim Blanchard began putting it together and then it really caught stride in the mid-80s. It was founded in the mid-80s. Popularity of gold, it had been popularized by the major move higher in in the precious metals through the late 70s and early 80s, and uh, it was really a gathering place. Uh, Well, for the old patriarchs, what we would call the true dyed-in-the-wool gold bugs back from the 1970s, I mean, Jim Blanchard was one of them, your dad, Don McIlvaney, Ian McCavity, is another one. I mean, these are guys who were there for the ideal, not necessarily for the bull market. Kevin, my dad called Jim Blanchard on the phone one day. This is, again, early 70s. And he said, Jim, we've got to do something about this. Keep in mind, the context is it's illegal to own gold in the United States. Sure, gold had been confiscated. It had been illegal since 1933. So 1973, 1974 rolls around, and they're trying to break the gridlock. And so they arranged to have Howard Sagamark write up legislation and and begin the lobbying proposal. He put it in front of uh, Jesse Helms. Yeah, that Jesse was later Helms. given to Jesse Helms, who pushed it through, didn't he? Pushed it through. Yeah. And January 1st, 1975, gold was made legal again here in the United States. Bullion gold and bullion coin gold. Collectibles had been legal, but you couldn't own actual bars of gold or bullion coins. Exactly. So really what you're looking at with a conference like this, Kevin, is it is still the watering hole of the folks who were there when it was philosophically bent. And you were looking at the issues of government, of power, of politics, of fiscal responsibility at a very deep philosophical level and trying to come up with a solution to that. Well, David, just a couple of days ago, you were actually in a room there at the conference and got some time with Ian McCavity. And it's always a great conversation because this is one of those men who really don't care whether gold goes up or down. He knows what it does as far as preservation and equalizing a monetary system, and that's why he does what he does every day. Kevin, just two words, because before we start the interview, everyone should know that one of the best newsletters that they could subscribe to that includes both technical analysis and fundamental analysis is Ian McAvity's deliberations on world events. And And decades and decades of experience. Yeah, it's a fantastic crystallization. You get to see in real time and benefit from the long experience, decades and decades in the marketplace. Ian McCavity is is one of the founders of the Central Fund of Canada. What started as a few million and then became a few hundred million is is now now seven billion dollars. Exactly. There's CEF and GTU, which are both gold and silver funds up in Canada. And so he, he keeps his finger on the pulse of these issues with a larger responsibility in mind, still advising in that capacity with CEF, with the Central Fund. He's very thoughtful, very forward-looking, and we'd like to know what he sees and thinks when he looks at world events today. Well, let's go to that recording right now. Well, there's a lot of things to talk about, yeah. and trying to wrap your mind around where we're going from here. In the U.S., there's been sort of a political divide between what was the Hamiltonian model versus sort of the Jeffersonian model. Centralization on the one hand, or something that was, you know, sort of prized the individual. And it appears to us that it's certainly moving more towards the Hamiltonian model. In Europe, you see the same thing. You would think that as Europe begins to unwind to some degree, that people would say, well, maybe we got to look at this differently. And in fact, you know, if you're looking at Germany as a test case, the SDP and the Green Party are, are gaining traction. The slowdown in the economy in Germany, they're blaming that on Merkel, but they're not th- seeing that anything is, is wrong with the system as it's progressing towards sort of a, a new and larger Leviathan. Where do you see this going? I mean, as, as you reflect, are you, are you happy? Are you sad? Are you yeah. <laughs> a few more scotches and maybe you can go back and forth between one or the other? The thing that strikes me is when I, every once in a while, whenever the question of you know, raising taxes comes up in the United States, they're very quick to boast that you know, 50% of the population is no longer on the tax rolls. 
And my reaction is, if more than half of the people are living out of other people's pockets, have, we, have they now created a dependency on the state that can never be undone? That's my largest fear. Basically, people are now servants of the state, which is the exact opposite of uh, the concept that I was brought up to believe in. And I've just watched, it, you know, watched them chip away at it over time. And, you know, I'm not a big sort of economic theorist in that sense, but the, you know, the idea, the Austrian economics idea that somehow the little guy at the bottom walking on the sidewalk is the most important part of the chain. So, you know, in a sense, he's, it's very much like the Swiss political model, you know, where the mayor is more important than the, than the president of the country. And that's my preference, but with the mature economies, uh, I, I think the political process has become so corrupted. I fear the accident that could lead to change. And if the change does occur, which way does it go? Because it's either going to go way off to the left or way off to the right, however you define them. Is it too simplistic to say that is one of the drivers in the metals markets today, where people are saying, we don't, we don't know what's happening. We don't know what's happening with taxes. We don't know what's happening in politics. We've got half of the G20 being replaced in 2012. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so what does the complexion of world politics look like next year? Is it more combative? Is everyone trying in a more concerted way to get yeah. along? Yeah. Basically, I refer to the G20 as the G13 versus the G7. You know, and you know, being a Canadian, uh, in essence, uh, you know, the Canadians are there largely just as a balancing mechanism. We've got no real business being in the G7 other than the fact that if Europe was going to expand its membership to please the Spanish and the Italians, then the Americans had to have, have a neighbor in as well. But the new wealth is essentially in the so-called BRICS, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China. I don't really include Russia too much because Russia has never had a, any history of mercantilism. So, you know, I, I just don't trust any part of the Russian system. But China, Brazil, and India have undergone an industrial revolution in a generation. In 10 or 15 years, they've now accumulated something like $6 trillion worth of foreign reserves. And they're looking at the old boys club depreciating the value of that paper about as quickly as they can. I'm waiting for the showdown, you know, where basically the new boys uh, explain to the old boys that their time has come. And from an investor point of view, you know, while the elephants are dancing, the smart mouse gets off the dance floor and hides. And basically, my premise, the, the line that I use for gold every time someone says, how high is gold going to go? It's got nothing to do with how high it's going to go. It's the only safe place to hide mm -hmm. because it has no counterparty risk, can't be printed, and just basically I'm not looking at gold because I'm trying to make money. I'm just trying to avoid getting trampled when the elephants tumble, you know, have their rumble. And to me, it's, you know, I look at gold in a totally defensive perspective at this point as I watch the bailout mechanisms come and go. I'm getting ever less or ever more distrustful. I was going to say I have ever less faith in the people that are trying to engineer all of these, the bailouts of the bailouts, or, you know, in the last few weeks, you know, we've had the Europeans coming up with a plan to have a plan to have a plan. And it's, uh, it's really troublesome. There's no simple solution, but the markets would like to believe that there is one. And as a result, you get the day trading mentality that, you know, the Europeans say, we've got a plan. The market goes up three or 500 points, and then somebody looks at the plan and realizes it's got more holes than Swiss cheese, and then you get out three or 500 points. And, you know, how do you translate any of that into a, what I would call a thinking man's investment decision? You know, by the time a thinking man actually contemplates it, you've had two bull markets and three bear markets. And then they close for the day. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting when we look at sort of the substructure for the U.S. economy and, and really one of the underpinnings for global trade, the dollar in the post Bretton Woods era, post-1945, has been critical. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's been a pillar. You mentioned the BRIC countries, sort of this trend of you know, the rise of the rest. Developed countries are, are becoming not totally passe. I mean, they, they still play a huge role in the global economy, but where the countries hitting their stride are the developing countries. Mm -hmm. 
that argues for a change in the monetary system. It doesn't necessarily mean that the dollar goes away. Um, if you put on your imagination cap mm -hmm. uh, and did a thought experiment, 2016 mm -hmm. rolls around. What significantly might have changed in the world monetary regime? I think that there's a crying need to get back to something like the Bretton Woods system. Because the key to the Bretton Woods system wasn't that it was a gold standard per se, but in essence the U.S. had all of the liquidity coming out of World War II, and the anchor was to define the U.S. dollar in terms of $35 so that there was a common denominator against which to measure all currencies. And that worked really quite well up into the 1960s until the American political process began to creep more and more into deficit mode. Mm -hmm. And also Europe had, by that time, had completed a lot of their post-war recovery, so Europe was in much better shape. And you started to build imbalances. And of course, the ultimate, to me, the two signal points that changed the equation was the Johnson speech on April 1, 1968, that we can have guns and butter, which was sort of formally announced to the world, we're going to depreciate the dollar. And then 1971, when Nixon finally slammed the gold window because they, you know, they could no longer sort of pretend, you know, sustain the illusion of any discipline on the dollar at all. And it's since 1971, of course, the spin is we're now going to go to a so-called floating exchange rate. And then we basically have gotten into a period that now translates to 40 years of everybody trying to devalue against each other. You know, so that's, and we're coming to a point that may be not unlike that Bretton Woods era, where there's sufficient liquidity in the hands of people that don't have a say, you know, the G13 of the G20, where they've got you know, $6 trillion of it. Uh, they're watching Europe flounder around trying to bail out Greece, Spain, Italy, and whoever. And American commentators are taking great delight in the agonies of Europe, which basically means they don't have to look at the US data, which actually makes Greece look fiscally disciplined. If you ever look at all of the debt problems of this country, you know Greece is perfect. There's no problem at all with Greece. But the external holders of that four, of those forex reserves, they've got, they need something that will be a, a common denominator. We'll never go back to a formal gold standard on the global scale because it, it basically is physically too cumbersome for the velocity of modern trade. I can envision some sort of a defined basket. It would include gold as a monetary component, uh, oil, copper, a lot of basic foodstuffs, and essentially have an indexing system but the only way that can work is if all of the major participants can be required to adhere to a discipline. And of course, everybody will adhere to it in good times, and then they'll all sneak out the back door and cheat. Does, <laughs> yes. does the commodity component, you know, whether it is oil, wheat, copper, gold, yeah. does that imply some sort of price fixing? That's what added stability to the 1944 yeah. agreement. You basically, what you, you need a common denominator in which a piece of paper can be related to a, an assortment of tangible goods that are in high demand. Yeah, I would say a combination of high demand and internationally diverse supply. When I was talking about this idea with one guy, he was saying, well, you know, we can get platinum in there too. And I said, no, you won't get platinum in there because there are too few producers. It's much too small a market. You know, it's got to be something like copper, like gold, like silver to a lesser degree because it's produced all over the place and it's consumed all over the place. You don't want a commodity that's produced in South Africa and Russia. Well, then the currency components within that basket, you're really talking about something that is more or less trade-weighted. Yeah. The dollar is still probably mm -hmm. the dominant currency in the basket. The dollar would still be important, and to me it's the salvation that they should, I wish they had built some structure like that into the euro when they first proposed the euro. I gave a speech in Ireland in 1992 in Dublin Castle when they had just announced the contest to name the new currency for Europe. And I said, well, hearing of this contest, there's only one name that really works, the Frankenstein. <laughs> because it's going to be run by the French and the Germans no matter what committee structure you put in place. 
And I said, unfortunately, the way it's being proposed is it's a currency that's designed to blow up in the first crisis. Because in a sense, you're creating a currency that doesn't have central bank discipline. It's got the European Central Bank, but each member has his own central bank, and you've got 17 or 27 political bodies that you have to deal with. And in some respects, that's encouraging in the sense that I don't really like central banks that much. But unfortunately, the ECB doesn't have enough power geopolitically. That, you know, so that at the end of the day, in a real crisis, you know, can you picture a Brit, a Frenchman, a German, an Italian, and a Spaniard agreeing on the time of day of the meeting that will be held to resolve the crisis? You know, that'll be the first three days of negotiations. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think that they will, the euro will end up surviving in part because everybody needs it, not just Europe. That everybody needs essentially a, a quasi-legitimate counterparty to the U.S. dollar, and well, that's you know, really the balancing. And that's what it is. And mm -hmm. basically, it's it's supported by a large enough economy, large enough GDP, international trade, and the rest of it. It's got the structure in place to be a valid currency. It's unfortunately it's a valid currency that doesn't quite have the disciplines we'd like to see. But on the other side of the coin, if you look at what Mr. Bernanke and Geithner are doing to the U.S. dollar, where allegedly it does have all the disciplines, I, th I think I respect the Greeks more. <laughs> yes. In a sense, the world needs competing currencies of that kind of stature. Uh, when Japan went through its great growth phase, they took great steps to not have the yen become an international currency. And the yen did become international, but it was all what we used to call Euro-yen, i.e. yen transactions denominated outside of Japan. So, you know, a Swiss bank and a British bank could create a yen obligation. You know, one's long, one's short, and now you've got a piece of yen paper. That's what used to be called a Euro transaction before they co-opted the name for the currency. And China will do the same. There's no way that China wants their currency floating outside of their control. It may be great for the American ego to be called the reserve currency of the world, but the minute you're in that status, you're subjected to an awful lot of external pressures over which you have no control. Isn't it sort of implicit in the Bretton Woods system that we will run deficit? It seems like that is... A uh, it wasn't at the time. The whole point of the $35 peg is when, if American numbers get too far out of control, we will take all of our dollars and we will arrive at the New York Fed and say, here's all your paper, we'll take all the equivalent gold at $35 an ounce. And what led to 1971 was a combination of the French and the Swiss arriving with a wheelbarrow with too much paper. Right. <laughs> well, the idea of covering our external liabilities, you know, 35 was chosen to cover our external liabilities back yeah. in 1933. And our stock of gold today, if we covered our external liabilities, would have to be north of $17,000 an ounce. Don't yeah. think that that's a reasonable equation. I don't think they'll be pursuing that. I don't think they're interested in... They never go to a straight equivalency because nowadays all of the, should we call them the political elites, are sufficiently arrogant that undoubtedly they can hire three Chinese PhDs in math to write a formula that nobody can understand. It will be the perfect formula, yeah. you know, until it blows up like every other one of them. But uh, my larger fear is if gold does end up playing a larger role, I, you know, as one of the founders of Central Fund of Canada, our, my point always has been the bullion is held in Canadian banks in a Canadian entity outside of the United States just in case Franklin Roosevelt gets reelected. I often tell audiences the People's Republic of Canada has made a lot of stupid political decisions over the years, but we didn't call in the gold in the 1930s. And these days I get all kinds of people saying, well, you know, is the government going to call in the gold? They now have a tax mechanism that makes that redundant. They don't need to call in the gold because they put in so many controls over financial transactions that your social security number is tattooed on everything and they could declare a 100% excess profits tax 
you know, this over is, a deemed amount of gold, and that's the equivalent of calling your gold. This has exactly been my concern. Yeah, and, and that's and my that that's been my fear. Change for the tax years. regime, and that's it. Whether it's jumping it from twenty eight percent, which it is now, to fifty percent. Yeah, you know, we may see gold at three, yeah. four, five thousand, or some other. Exactly, area, but doesn't mean you get to keep the yeah. profits. So, well, and that's that's always been one of the arguments for international diversification, and not just for Americans, but sure. for citizens of any country. Right. When a country gets in a crisis and passes laws, they tend to harness their own, not necessarily the transient visitor. I give a speech every year in Zurich, and I always you know, thank the Swiss for maintaining the most wonderful country for a Canadian to visit. You know, unfortunately, they don't look quite as, maybe with some, quite the same friendly eye on U.S. passports anymore. Not anymore. And uh, they beat up their own citizens pretty severely. But for foreigners, non-American foreigners in Switzerland, it's the ultimate financial haven to deal in and to visit and to live in. Well, I've got one old friend uh, who's, I don't want to give the title of the book away, but it, the only way I can describe it is the dog bone philosophy. If you've got sufficient capital, you know, be like a dog. Bury a bone in every backyard because you're never entirely sure which backyard you're going to find yourself in. <laughs> <laughs> well, Eisenhower changed the rules in 61, made it illegal for U.S. citizens to own gold overseas. Mm -hmm. It was Kennedy. Was it Kennedy? It was part of the interest equalization tax, but okay. it wasn't just gold. It was all foreign investment that he brought in. It was 62, I think. Okay, I'm off then. Yeah. Because Americans couldn't own gold anywhere. Right. After 35, and they tightened the rules up a little bit in that period. It was 63 you know, when the interest equalization tax came in, because I was a broker in Montreal at that point. Uh, that was when the airline stocks were all hot. And KLM was one of the first international airlines to go to jets, so it became the great growth stock. KLM and Pan Am were the two big favorites. And what we discovered in Canada is under the interest equalization tax, KLM traded in New York under two prices. It was KLM meant that it was the international stock, international seller, so that if an American wanted to buy it, he had to pay the price of the stock plus an interest equalization tax, and I think at one point it was 20 or 25 percent. But then the New York Stock Exchange also traded KLM.Z, which meant that it was already owned by an American, and there was like a 20% or 25% price differential to reflect the tax had already been paid. Hmm. So being with typical creativity, a number of Canadians discovered that a great many Americans had married European ladies uh, at the end of World War II and moved back home, and many of those European ladies still had family friends on the other side who could buy KLM in Amsterdam and uh, transfer it down the family who could then sell it as American-owned stock. And the, uh, I think something in the order of 30% of KLM's market cap came across the ocean that way. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting because there's a, a ring of familiarity with the current FATCA legislation supposed mm -hmm. to be oh, yeah. in motion in 2013, yeah. um, where foreign institutions you know, withhold in, for, on any U.S. product, whether and, and that can even be Treasuries, yeah. which is almost insane when you think about the fact that the Treasury Department is is limiting their own audience uh, yeah. for U.S. product, and I, and I realize they have different intentions, but it's sometimes the unintended consequences. That, that it's just another form of protectionism. Everybody wants control over everything. My biggest complaint about so many, you know, speaking as a Canadian, as an outspoken Canadian, knocking, as I always do, knocking Washington, this concept of America having a presumed right to the extraterritorial application of American law. Since when and where does Washington get the idea that they can dictate to Switzerland What's going on in a transaction that occurs between Switzerland and Belgium if it happens to include either an American citizen or an American expat who doesn't even live here? And yet somehow they keep passing all of these codes as if the entire world abandoned their powers to certain power-crazed idiots in Washington. But this extraterritorial application of American law drives me nuts. And more recently, now you've got them building drone bases, so you've now got murder squads where you don't have to risk your troops. Now, and picture the Chinese 
Imagine China has some guy that they decide is a terrorist. He blows up a train in a railway station. He flees, disappears, and the Chinese have got a worldwide search for him. They finally find that he's hiding in Seattle. Can you picture the outrage if out of the blue, all of a sudden, some little bug in the sky becomes a drone that comes down and blows up a Chinese guy walking out of a Starbucks shop in Seattle? And China explains, oh, don't worry, that was just a drone attack taking rid of one of our number one terrorists. If that happened on this soil, CNN would burn out every TV set in the country. <laughs> and yet, somehow, the State Department's got the right in the name of fighting terrorism or whatever to go to any country in the world and shoot anybody they want. It just it drives me crazy. It bugs me that, uh, that any power, anybody has, it claims to have that power. Well, on a similarly philosophical note, you know, when you look at your experience, you've worked in the markets for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. you've, you've done analysis for a long, long time, thought along fundamental lines, and looked at a lot of charts in your day. Is there anything you're particularly enthusiastic about at this point, or when you look mm -hmm. and say, you know, I wish this just wasn't the case? I'd like the sage opinion of where we're at, where are we going, and, and yeah. is there something that we should be doing? Because sometimes I get the question from our clients, you know, it's one thing to be in the armchair as a critic. What can we do creatively mm -hmm. to make a difference? Yeah. All is lost, as I, I guess Edmund Burke would say, uh, all that's necessary for evil to triumph is that good men do nothing. Mm -hmm. From one side, it's sort of a reflective question. On the other, it is more about praxis. Is there something we should do? Let me put it in stock market cycle terms. We basically had a great secular bull market from 1982 to, to 2000. It may be topped out with the uh, long-term capital management bailouts in 1998, where we, that's really when we got into this modern bailout mechanism that's essentially created a period that you can call a secular other or a secular bear. That's not unlike the period between, after the crash of 29 through 1949, or not unlike 65 to 82, or the first 20 years of the last century. You know, to me, we're in that secular other phase. And in that secular other phase, the individual cycles will tend to be smaller on the upside because those are then contra-trend moves. So, so the bull markets mm -hmm. last shorter and go less far with greater urgency. And then the bear markets run longer and deeper. And given the excess liquidity in the system, the safest bet of all is you can bet on greater volatility because you've got more and more liquidity chasing around and the New York Stock Exchange with their high velocity feed, basically you're now legalizing front running you know, for computers. And when two computers operating in nanoseconds get to see your trade before it gets to the market, that hasn't got anything to do with, front, with market price discovery in the marketplace. And so this market, we're in an ugly period I think we've, in the last few months, rolled over. I think we're now starting the second half of the bear market of 2007-2009. And uh, if the S&P 500 is below 1258 on December 31st of this year, that will be the first negative pre-election year since 1939. And I think 2012 is going to be a down year for the election year. You know, it, what's Obama got to run on in the race? other than the fact that the Republican leadership race looks as though it's being organized by the Democrat National Committee, trying to determine who would Obama most like to run against. The political process is almost as corrupted as, as Washington is. But I think the stock market generally is going down. And one of the best calls, I'm not known as a stock picker per se, but one of the best calls I've probably made this year, the New York Gold Show on a closing panel, the very last question that was sort of a curveball that was thrown at us, tell people what's the best single buy that they can make for the next 12 months. And fortunately, I had just learned that they had started trading some ETFs that were measuring volatility. And I said, well, the only surefire double I can see is volatility is going to go up. And learn to hedge. That doesn't mean you gamble on them. But, you know, if you've got core assets that you want to hold on to, how can you protect those core assets? You know, gold in that sense is the purest protection. Mm -hmm. But for many people, it's still going to be volatile in price. It goes from 1600 to 1900, comes back to 1600. 
some people think, oh, I can't stand a $300 loss. And my reaction is, look back three months before and you didn't have the $300 gain to lose. <laughs> The biggest mistake some new gold investors make is even watching the price from day to day. Right. They'll buy it from a philosophic point of view and then start thinking like a day trader. To me, that's the biggest mistake they can make in relation to gold. But in terms of you know core assets, uh, I was joking at one stage in one panel that we're rapidly coming to a point where I would almost prefer to own corporate debt issued by multinational companies that have really truly global franchises and not too much of a debt structure. You know, something like a Coca-Cola. You know, you can buy Coca-Cola anywhere in the world at this point and half their assets and most of their business is outside the country. I'd rather buy a Coca-Cola bond than a U.S. government bond. Because, you know, whatever happens within this country, Coca-Cola is going to keep on going. You know, Procter & Gamble and a lot of them, you know, Nestle from Switzerland, the multinational companies are almost outside the state now. Mm -hmm. You know, so from a, from a bond investor, you know, what can I own in the way of bonds? I'd prefer to own a, a true multinational that has some discipline over its balance sheet. Because there isn't a sovereign issuer that has any discipline in their balance sheet. Well, we do live in interesting times, and we appreciate you sharing your thoughts with us. It's a challenge looking ahead and, and trying to determine the best course. Uh, you've hit on a couple of critical elements of that. You know, a conservative approach, very important. Mm -hmm. Not viewing gold as a, as a speculative mm -hmm. vehicle, but as, as an insurance policy, per se, is, is a better way to, to go. And let me add one thing to that, because the thought, your comment brings to mind the, the late Harry Brown, who was one of the great libertarian thinkers in this country. But I remember some of the early talks where Harry was building towards it. And when you look at a portfolio, don't look at it in the context of how much can I make, how much can I make on each component. Look at each component. If I lose here, does something else gain? All right. Balance it out and construct it from the point of view of defense rather than offense. Because invariably I talk to people and they want to know how much they can make. And my reaction is, well, okay, what have you got covering the back side of that trade? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in the secular phase that we're in, I think thinking more defensively, it doesn't mean you stop investing. But it does mean that when you look at your portfolio statement, yeah. you may have losses that you're happy about because they were the offset to other trades exactly. that you're equally happy about. Exactly. I've, I've owned my, probably my third largest holding this year has been this VIX uh, ETF that I discovered in Canada and this construction of it, I you know I'm getting eaten alive by the rollovers, but on the other side of the coin there have been several tops and bottoms where I've looked at it and I said, ah, it's probably going to go down now. And my reaction is similar to my decision on, I live in, in downtown Toronto, I've been in the same place for years, where I've been through real estate cycles. And at the top of a couple of cycles, I've said, nah, it's a home, not an investment, so I won't sell. And in a sense, I own the, the volatility coverage, not because I'm trying to make money, I know I'm about to lose some in the short term, but I don't mind. If I'm losing, it's because other things are going up. And if you start thinking of a balanced approach, I don't think enough people think that way in terms of buying a portfolio. They want every single holding to perform. I think what you've just expressed is a maturity born through experience and many years of testing and, and understanding. Markets don't always accommodate. The way I describe it is they don't always listen to what I tell them to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. David, what a great interview. I can see why you guys have been not just you know professional friends, but family friends for, you know, what is it, 40 years as far as the you know, McIlvaney and the McAvity family go. Well, Kevin, it, he just brings a certain clarity and, and matter-of-factness to certain issues. And I, looking at, for instance, Harry Brown's defensive construction I'm portfolio. so glad he brought that up. That's been around for years, but people forget the balanced part of the portfolio. Well, and the balance is absolutely critical. Kevin, obviously that's a very mature perspective with sort of the defensive construction of a portfolio being paramount, which is not just about 
profitability and gains. And that's a temptation. It's a temptation for investors who see a little bit of green on the screen and say, well, I'd like a little bit more. Sure. And, and if there's red, then get rid of that and give me a little bit more green, not realizing that there can be these offsetting positions that complement each other very well, lower total volatility, and ultimately give a higher rate of return, but in the immediate, you know, show sort of this balancing act between red and green. Well, and David, it reminds me of flying. You know, we've talked about flying planes. I've worked with Civil Air Patrol, and I don't want to be morbid here, but we call Bonanzas and Moonies, which are pretty high-powered small planes, doctor killers. Because these doctors, they see success in everything that they do, and then they get into investing, and it's like, I can do the same thing with an airplane. They're low-time flyers. Oftentimes, this is not what they do all the time. You get up there, you fly fast, you fly hard, and you also fly right into the side of a mountain. And you want to get there and see the thing that kills more pilots than anything, you know, is needing to get there when you really shouldn't, when you need to be defensive, when you need to be sitting back on the runway and actually not going anywhere until the clouds clear. And the triangle, in a way, does that. The triangle does not force you to get there because you have, you don't just have one side covered. You have three different things working. Maybe you'll have a loss on one side, but you probably have a gain on one of the other two sides. Well, Kevin, a couple of other things that stood out to me from our conversation with Ian was that, you know, this period of a secular other, it's Mm -hmm. Difficult to see the period in time that we're in as a bear market, largely because just like 1966 to 1982, it went sideways, and the real lunch eating occurred on the basis of inflation. So the bear was eating your lunch because that two, three, four, five, six, seven, whatever the current rate of inflation was then and is now, was catching up with you with a zero percent rate of return. Don't you think it's more deceptive that way, David? Because he says the bulls are smaller and shorter, so you get more bulls. Actually, little bull market bursts. But the bears, the downside, run longer and deeper. And, you know, you talk to an investor who's invested just sort of the old-fashioned way with, you know, with one of the major brokerages over the last 10 years who think like they did in the 90s and in the 80s. These people have just a confused look on their face because every time they think they're just about to make money, they lose a little bit more. But it takes so long that they've let 10 years pass, and they're like, oh, my gosh. It really is not only the lost decade, but I've lost all this decade. Well, and the last thing that stood out to me, Kevin, was was the dog bone philosophy. You know, <laughs> right. we just pragmatically say you don't know what yard you're going to end up in, and then better to have a bone in each yard. Bury a bone in Switzerland, bury a bone in Canada. That makes sense to me, Kevin. That makes sense from the standpoint, not as a, an American, but as an anyone. Right. You know, wherever you live, looking at your jurisdiction differently with a greater historical perspective and insight into the nature of desperate governments, you know, harnessing the power of your own. That's an interesting concept when you realize that that's the easiest go-to before you start spending ammunition to harness the power of another. Well, David, this is a great time for you to get together with people who have been in the industry for a long time. Next week, maybe we can even listen to the interview with the Aiden sisters. That's right. We got a chance to visit with both of them while we were in New Orleans, and that was also a very fruitful conversation. Well, you've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck, along with David McIlvaney and our guest today, Ian McCavity. You can find us at McIlvaney.com. That's M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y dot com. Or give us a call at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.